1.5 seconds after the Hellfire missile comes off the rail, it hits the sound barrier and uh, creates a sonic boom. So the sonic boom does hit the target before the missile actually impacts. Um, that's, that was my experience. Every single shot that I fired, someone reacted to it before the missile actually impacted, which was also something that was pretty horrific because you, you know that the person that you're watching is going to die and they're supposed to not know that they're going to die and then they react to it maybe two to three seconds before missile impact. And so you see the, the fear. I think the hardest thing for the other drone operators um, to do is, is for coming forward is because a lot of them have a lot to lose. A lot of them have friends and families and jobs and lives, and I kind of was in the position where I had none of that. Um, so it was easy for me. Uh, and the, 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 th the interesting thing is that none of the people that have been critical of me have ever um, said anything other than they just didn't want me to talk because it's like airing dirty laundry. They just don't want people to know about it. Uh, and I think that a lot of them are ashamed. A lot of them are uncomfortable with, with doing it, but they're kind of stuck. I think that the best way for them to, to come forward is for them to understand that it's, it's okay to make a mistake, regardless of whatever type of mistake that it, that it is. And they need support. We can't act like the United States did in the Vietnam era where we were calling every person that participated in military actions a baby killer. They need to be, we need to be supportive of our troops, like the United States says that they are, but they really are not. We need to be supportive of our troops to be able to protect us if that is the case, but if they're not protecting us and they are being manipulated to be a part of the military industrial complex, we need to encourage them to be able to come forth and talk about it. It needs to be accepted that it's okay for a military member to talk about their military experiences because the people need to know. You need to know. We are democratic republics. We not only vote our politicians into office, we actually should be voting on whether or not we do military actions around the world. And so you guys, us, as whether it doesn't matter what country that you are, we are in charge of our military. That's kind of the idea of it. Like the military is the right hand of the people, it is the strong hand of the people. And if we are going to abuse that, if someone's going to abuse it, it's not the people that are going to be using it that are going to pay the consequences, it's going to be you guys. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we are dealing with that right now. And the, the best way to, to go about it isn't to be against soldiers serving in the military or, or not serving in the military, but to allow them to do so, and then if something is wrong, be supportive of them as their bosses, literally, you are their bosses, and so they should be reporting to you. And you guys should definitely be reminded of what people go through in order to participate in the war, and they should be reminded that, A, if it needs to happen, then it needs to happen, and they've got the support, but it's okay to say no. Like, it's okay to say no. One of the fascinating things about the hierarchy within the military is that drone pilots are actually, in terms of their social status, absolutely the lowest level of the American Air Force. Um, they're, and, and you could talk a little bit about that. And this is kind of the bizarre thing about, um, you know, the, the drones are always want, wanting to be used. People always want to use drones, whether it's special forces or convoy escorts or any thing like that, they're always being requested for. Um, but because we wear flight suits and we're not actually flying actual aircraft, people that actually fly aircraft look down on us. We're, we're the, I don't know if the term in German, but redheaded stepchild of the American forces. Um, so it's, it's, we're looked down upon by the people that actually fly aircraft. 
And then when we have issue with what's happening and we complain about it, we're, we're degraded, we're belittled, we're told that we're Nintendo warriors. Uh, people that are on the ground, soldiers that should be respected for being in harm's way, hate us because they think that their trauma is worse than ours, which in effect it is. It's, I, I look at it as a sort of erosion, like they deal with earthquakes and volcanoes, and we kind of deal with rivers and tsunamis. Uh, it, it's, it's a type of uh, mental and moral erosion that can barely be compared, but everyone wants to, to do some sort of genital measuring contest. And it, it doesn't work, because it, this is something completely new, and we have to look at it as like, what is it doing to our psyche? But because it is new and known, it, it's not traditional, it's not actual aircraft, it's we're not in country, we're flying from the United States, we can leave our work from being in a war, we're in a war zone mentally, to going home and having a burger and a beer and playing with our kids or playing with our dogs or whatever it is, playing video games, we're looked, we're looked at as less. I'll go with the technical aspect first because that's a lot easier. Um, so the technical aspect of it is, yes, it is like playing a video game. I'm looking at a center screen, I've got my my map above me, I've got my heads-up display below me, giving me uh, engine parameters, uh, fuel, uh, engine temperatures, all sorts of information down there. Um, I've got, you know, whether or not I'm firing the laser, all that stuff on the screen. I've got, um, over here I have my secret uh, chat rooms and my map, uh, my airspace coordination. I have over here my top secret uh, chat rooms and then I have over here my um, mission chat rooms. So you're, you're monitoring a lot of information and the best way to go about it is to, like, you're, you've got your, this kind of check. So you, you're, you go like this, you just kind of, right there, like, you do it like every five minutes or so and it's, it's consistent, but the skill set's the same. You've got a, a flight control stick, you've got a zoom lever, uh, you've got a keyboard in front of you, you can chat with anyone. It's strangely the most perverted map, uh, MMO I've ever participated in. Um, and uh, to continue on that aspect, uh, there are video games out there that play like um, that condition people. Uh, the United States military does fund games like Call of Duty and Battlefield, uh, the first person shooter type experiences. And uh, one of the interesting things that I've come across in talking with psychologists and doing my own research is that um, these types of games condition people to react instinctively, which is the exact same way that they they taught me when I was in the military to react when I was getting weapons training, as well as when I was doing drone training. Now, the difference between first-person shooters of this type versus games like Grand Theft Auto or Mass Effect that give you the choice is that the, the people that are given, in a video game, if you're given a choice to do violence or not do violence, and, be, and you choose to do violence, when you stop playing that game, and you go out into the wider world, it's been shown that you actually have the, a greater moral capacity because you've exercised a decision in a fantasy setting and you understand that you won't do that in the greater, wider sense of the world. But with first-person shooters and that type of training, it's been shown that if you play one of those games for 30 minutes minimum, and then you stop playing um, 15 minutes after you get done, you, you have no control over your compulsion. So that you are, like, if someone pisses you off, you're most likely to go flying off the handle. If you go and you're going to go buy something almost immediately afterwards, you're more likely to buy more of that item than you are to hold yourself back. You have no control over your, your self-control. You have no self-control. And so people, what I think is that people should be aware of this type of thing that's happening. This is the new form of social influence the social control, the social conditioning. 
And, and kids don't know that. We don't teach people basic psychology until they get into college. And I think that's a, that's a, we don't teach people to be aware of themselves and what they're doing in everyday life and, and how things, uh, how people interact with things. The same reason why books were banned, because they were giving people new ideas that they wouldn't get anywhere else, is the same, the same thing that, that video games are doing, which they shouldn't be banned, but they should be understood from a psychological and social standpoint. In World War II, the American generals were kind of looking at the uh, soldiers, and, and they were seeing uh, a consistency with not just World War II, but past wars, that only 20% of soldiers actually fire at people to kill them. It's a natural human thing to not want to harm another human being. But the United States military was kind of looking at this whole issue is, how do we change that? How do we increase it? Because you have soldiers firing at people to miss. They fire at the ground, they fire in the air. And, and it's more about posturing. It was more about intimidating your, your enemy to not attack. Well, they, they changed it. They changed the way that, that they, they, they started learning about psychology and, and how to manipulate human beings and how to train them. And so by the time we get to Vietnam, that number increased from 20% to a 75% fire and kill rate. And as we're looking now in the Iraq-Afghanistan conflict, it's a 95% fire and kill rate. So it shouldn't surprise anyone ever why when soldiers are going into these areas after the training that they've received that they're actually able to kill so easily. And it should be known to everybody how easily manipulated we can be in order to do these things. And it should be actually us. It should be us who protests war because war shouldn't, we shouldn't accept war as being a solution to anything. We shouldn't accept that war, going off and har harming another person, actually be a viable solution to any sort of problem. It should be the last resort that we rely on. How do I see my own responsibility in this? Well, no one forced me to do this. I can tell you that one. No one forced me to come out and talk about my experiences. So, A, I'm doing this of my own merit and my own desire because I recognize that I was wrong. And I don't believe that any court system is going to, to, to punish me worse than I would punish myself. And the fact that I have been here for four years, and it was only until it wasn't until November that anyone else joined me up here, and now I have six other operators that are behind my back. Says something. It's not the soldiers that that are not given the correct information on what's going on, because when I was in the service, I wasn't told who it was we were going after. I was told that these were bad guys, and while I'm not going to say that's an excuse. I'm, I'm just saying that's just what was going on. And it wasn't until later that I actually found out and I was horrified when we were going, what we were doing. So there is this, this, this lack of information. And I'm pretty sure that no one really knows what's going on in the entire system. Because while I'm sitting there watching people play, out, play their lives out, I'll tell you this story, actually. There was, there was one guy that we actually walked to plant an IED in the middle. Uh, an explosive device, improvised explosive. improvised explosive device in the middle of the road. And then we were told we were going to go home, we were going to follow this guy, and we were going to... Hello, okay. <laughs> so, we were told that we were going to follow this guy back to a location, and then we were going to strike him. And what happened was, this guy pulls up to his house, pulls into his courtyard, and he was driving a white pickup truck with a red stripe down the side of it. And he places his Kalashnikov AK-47 onto his vehicle, and then he goes down to a knee, and his child runs out of the building, and he gives his father a hug. And then he, is, he sends his kid off away, 
goes over and hugs his wife, who was hanging laundry up on the clothesline, and then his son, or whoever child comes back, I don't know if it was a boy or a girl, comes back, and they start kicking the soccer ball back and forth. And my leadership is telling me that this guy is a man who deserves to die because he planted a bomb in a road in his homeland to deal whatever his reason was. And I'm sitting there watching this whole thing play out, and the only thing that these people that are giving the orders, well, the only thing that they're seeing is, is a clip. They see the, the two-minute clip of the guy planting a bomb, and that's when they make the, their, their kill decision. They don't care about the rest of the thing. They could give a fuck about the, the rest of the lives that these people have. They don't, they don't care. That's, that's the thing that is missing. And then the people that are, are signing off on the orders, they don't, they don't see anything. They see just that, that small bit of information. And so what this system is made to do is to get rid of the responsibility of, of everyone involved so no one knows everything that's happening. And the only people that are intimately involved are the people that are the operators and the intelligence analysts. And then we're given this weird set of orders that, that kind of go against our consciousness because we see the entire truth. We see the entire person. But we don't know, A, who these people are, we just see that they're human. Um, so the first question is, uh, what was the reaction from the populace back home? About 66% of Americans approve of drone strikes. And that is simply because they don't no longer want to see people come home in caskets. I think that's the easiest explanation for them. What happens is is that we we have this idea that uh, we don't need boots on the ground. But I think that kind of really belittles the idea of people that are trained to deal with the military. The the idea of a warrior, which kind of seems to be thrown around all over the place lately is that it's someone who understands the physical, mental, and spiritual effects on warfare, not only on themselves, but the people that are affected by it. And they spend their lives trying to prevent it from getting out of control. They're supposed to be professionals. And if we take men off the battlefield, then we lose the professionals of, of the professionalism of the people that are supposed to be there doing this type of job. Now, that's the ideal scenario. The reality of what happens is that we just we just invade and kill and continue doing that, and, and that's wrong as well. Which goes back to the point that the people need to know exactly what's happening in war in order to hold the soldiers accountable, so the soldiers can be more professional, so the soldiers can go do their job or whatever job that they need to be needs to be done. And we cannot make the excuse that we don't want to lose people's lives to go and do military action because that, that, that gets rid of the whole idea of sacrifice, of cost. There is a cost of, of waging war and the cost has to be people. The cost has to be that if you are going to go and harm another human being, you have to be willing to put yourself in harm's way. And while while warfare is considered asymmetrical, it's always the person that has the best weapon. If you take the human component out of war, then, then you make it so that anyone can wage war. There is no more professionalism in it. And then, then there is no more need for a military. And that's where you get ad hoc terrorist, terrorist organizations, or organizations that want to do harm to other people, and that you give them the ability to do so without any sort of cost or... or, or or gain, and it just destroys the entire system. At least that's my opinion. Take it as you will. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then, as far as uh, the reaction from the populace, it, it's been uh, the United States uh, media has been really quiet on about uh, on me for about a year and a half now. Um, they didn't report that I got any sort of award. They didn't really report that. Uh, three other operators came out at the U.S. premiere of our uh, documentary Drone um, in November. Uh, it's been really, really, really quiet, though I believe that General Hayden's letter uh, in the New York Times was probably a direct response to our letter in The Guardian uh, from November. Uh, but people forget, or, or he forgot to mention that his direct involvement in the corporations that are actually being 
uh, developing this technology are also paying him as well. So um, it, it, it's been really quiet back home. Uh, I think that no one really knows how to react because we have propaganda in the media just saying drones are good, drones are good, drones are good. And then we have me and a few others saying that it's not and they don't know how to react to it. Uh, second question was how are drones armed and fired? Um, so the Predator drone is a uh, fully loaded and fully uh, fueled. It's about 2,600 pounds. I, I'm sorry, I'm really not that good at metric. Um, I know, I am Americans. Um, uh, but it's, uh, the Predator drone can have two uh, AGM-114 uh, uh, air-to-ground Hellfire missiles, which are 108-pound warheads, which are very precise, should be. So the, one of the questions of collateral damage is going to kind of be answered in this. Ideally, you can, uh, at about 3 nautical miles away, at 18,000 feet in the air, you can point a laser at a target and hit within a foot of that target, so there really shouldn't be any sort of collateral damage. The problem is, is that the intelligence becomes bad, and the scenarios become bad, and whatever collateral damage happens, happens because of human error, and uh, on all, all fronts, um, not just the people that are pulling the trigger, but the people that are gathering the intelligence. And uh, you cannot make war sterile and clean in this manner. And that's kind of what this technology has proven. Um, the Reaper drone can carry up to eight Hellfire missiles, uh, two 500-pound bombs and a 1,000-pound bomb, I believe. And it uh, was supposed to replace the F-16 um, in the United States Air Force. But, of course, fighter pilots don't want to fly anything other than fighter jets, and they feel insulted flying drones. Um, and so the, the, there's a... Uh, the, the arming and firing of a drone is not as complicated as it, as it seems. Um, there is a delay. One, uh, 1.5 seconds after the Hellfire missile comes off the rail, it hits the sound barrier and uh, creates a sonic boom. So the sonic boom does hit the target before the missile actually impacts. Um, that's, that was my experience. Every single shot that I fired, someone reacted to it before the missile actually impacted, which was also something that was pretty horrific because you, you know that the person that you're watching is going to die, and they're supposed to not know that they're going to die, and then they react to it maybe two to three seconds before missile impact. And so you see the, the fear, you see the... the you just wonder what these, this person's thinking right before it happens, and it's, it's not fun. It's not clean or sterile, and it's, it's um, I think that killing in this way is worse than killing in person, because there is no, I, I don't hear anything. I don't hear anything but a hum of the computers. I don't feel anything but the click of a button, and the, the, the seat that I'm, I'm sitting in, and it's, it's um, and, but I know that it's not a video game. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the, the idea that this person isn't going to, uh, I can't restart the level, I can't press reset, and, and all of a sudden this person's got their, their lives back. Maybe they don't even have extra lives. So, it, it, the, like, you see the real, con it's funny, it can be funny. Like, the idea is absurd <coughs> enough that it can be laughed at, but the, the real consequences of, of the matter is, is that you see the, everything that happens. You see the missile coming off the rail, you see the person, uh, how they react to it, you see the strike, you see the aftermath, you see the people coming up and picking up the body parts, you see everything that happens and you have to watch it and make you watch it. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's how I'm going to answer it. Um, Okay, de demonstrating against drone bases. Um, this has been something that I've thought about quite a bit because I'm unsure of whether or not uh, people care enough to actually demonstrate in the numbers that are needed 
in this kind of interactive social media age where people can just share something on Facebook and that's about as much of a protest as you're going to get out of the person. Um, uh, it, it's, it's really hard because with this technology that's being that, that's that's out there and as interconnected as we are, how to get people to care can not just at that one moment, but consistently enough. Um, protesting outside of drone bases can make a point. It can make a point. It can show like, hey, we are, we we have a presence here. Pay attention to us. But how you want to get where I think that the idea should be is to get in connection with these operators and not to just protest against, hey, what you're doing is, is bad, but hey, if you need support, we will offer you support. Um, one of my friends who was at Creech actually told me about how they couldn't get on the base because protesters got in front of the base gate. And the commanders, the commanders aren't there. The, command, the people that are giving the orders, they're not affected by this type of stuff. So you're looking at, if, if you block off the gate, you're looking at the people preventing themselves from getting onto base, replacing the people that are in the seat. And the people that are in the seat have to extend their day even further to continue doing the mission. And that should be taken into consideration where, like, when, you, know, you want to know how we actually protested this shit while the program was starting when I was in, you encourage people to fly with the gear down. Like, can't, probably can't do that anymore. We would fly with the gear down so we would burn fuel faster so we could land and so we wouldn't have to sit in the seat. Um, but pilots would do that. Yeah, pilots would do that. They, they hate it. Pilots hate this shit. The people that are actually doing the job, they really, most of them hate it. Most of them think that it's a waste of their time and skills because they're sitting there for eight hours a day, eight to 12 hours a day, and, and they're not living their own life. And they are, they're there 8 to 12 hours a day, up to 6 days a week, 365 days a year. They don't get the vacations that they need. They don't get the time off. There's too many people getting out of the program versus the, ability, or the, the numbers that are training to replace them. So they're, they're being bled dry. And they need support. Bake them some cookies. Have a base there outside of the base and say, "Hey, here's some cookies. Make some, make some weed cookies so that when they have to go piss test, they fail their piss test." I mean, be creative in it. Just, just show them support. I think is the, the key point is to show them support, to show them that they're loved, and to show them that they really don't have to be a tool to accomplish someone else's political gains. Okay, so the collateral damage question. Um, you know, I never really thought about the collateral damage question because every single strike that I had, I was told it was a legitimate target. The only time that I dealt with collateral damage was my second Hellfire shot when I watched a child run from out of screen and into the building that we were targeting. and. My leadership told me that it was a dog that ran into the screen. Well, it wasn't the leadership, it was uh, uh, the, the screener. And then when I brought that issue to my leadership, my leadership told me to drop the issue. And so that was that's my experience with the collateral damage stuff. Um, and then as I, as I got out of the program and started reading the journalistic reports, especially by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, and uh, seeing all these things that were going on, who was actually the victims of these strikes, like, it made me realize that I don't even know. I, I have no idea who I killed. I think that that's one of the things that I have my lawyer actually requesting um, from the Freedom of Information Act, is if they can actually tell me who it was that I killed. Because, and my, my final shot that I took, I killed five individuals and a camel that we waited to come through a mountain pass, and they, we, we waited until they bedded down for the night. And that, I, I have no idea who they were. If they were someone that we had human, in, we, we were told we had human intelligence that these people were bad guys, but who was giving us the human intelligence? Was it someone who was a rival of this person, who had a family feud with this person, who had a, 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 a blood? 
rivalry with this person, or was it actual military intelligence, actionable intelligence, um, good intelligence, and we were, this was a good target, because we were also told that these guys were carrying explosives, and there was no secondaries, um, secondary explosive explosions once the missile actually did it. So it's, it's a really hard question to a uh, answer from my perspective, because my involvement in that has been so little, but I can tell you that, as far as I'm concerned, every single strike that I've had is collateral. Excuse me. Um, I think that uh, this needs to be looked at from the people's sense. Uh, the German government is going to be getting drones. And uh, uh, when I knew about it two years ago, they were supposed to be getting Reaper drones that were supposed to be unarmed. And I told people exactly this, that why would they be getting a drone that is meant to replace the F-16 fighter jet as a um, armed aircraft as unarmed. Well, if it's going to be used only for surveillance, then that's the first step that they're going to use to justify to arm it in the next round. And right now, it looks like you guys are going to get armed drones at this point. So it needs to be looked at at this. We are extremely interconnected as people. We are the most interconnected that we've ever been in the entire history of mankind. And so the power really does rely on the people to be informed about the decisions that are going to be happening. And so if this is the case, if your government is going to be getting these drones, you guys need to know what they're being used for. Are they going to be used to fly over German soil, especially with the whole refugee crisis thing going on, and refugees are being a, accepted in the European countries, now they can say, well, we're going to be flying drones over these camps or over uh, refugee areas or wherever else they'll, they'll excuse. But then, what's the next step? Is the next step to justify it being used against citizens of that country? Are we going to repeat the same mistakes that we did 100 years ago, 75 years ago? We are... The German, and, and right now, the German people are in the, the greatest position ever to actually show how these things should be used if they're going to be used in Europe. They, they, they need to show, they need to set the example. I don't know how, it's not, I don't have the ideas for that. That's, that's, it's your guys' job. But that should be the step that everyone thinks, is like, how are we going to do this? Are we going to accept this? Are we going to, to continue going along the path that the United States is going on, which was the path that Germany was going on 100 years ago? Um, <clears throat> so I always, actually, when I was in the service, I'd always been critical towards what we were doing. Um, when I was leaving, actually, the 3rd Special Operations Squadron, they were giving us awards, and we, everyone gets to stand up in front of everyone and say a few words, and they wouldn't let me say any words because I would bash them. Um, so, but the reason I got out, actually, originally was because my contract ran. I spent six years in active duty military, and my contract was up. And then I decided I wasn't going to re-enlist because I just couldn't, I couldn't stay in that environment. It's, it's a, a filth pit, if you will. Um, and actually, what started my um, really examining and talking with people about this is I, I took for granted what was going on, because so I would go home and People knew I was a drone operator, and it was kind of, it was eerily celebrated. Uh, and then when I got out of the service, about six months to the day I got out, uh, Abdullah Rahman Alawaki was killed in a drone strike, and that was Anwar Alawaki's 16-year-old uh, son. And uh, I knew why. I knew the reason why they took him out was because they didn't want him to become um, a martyr, or they didn't want him to become uh, a rallying point, if, if you want to call it that, and 
I was talking to my friends and family about it, and my friends didn't want to hear anything about it. They were disgusted the fact they're like, "Oh, this isn't this isn't what the U.S. military does. This is this is unheard of." And then my family just they didn't want to hear about it. They only wanted to, to preach Jesus to me. So um, I uh, stayed in the military for two years, um, and then ended up in getting injured in the service in another job, and my. The, the U.S. military kicked me to the streets and basically told me to take care of myself. And I started having nightmares about the people that I had uh, killed and helped kill. And I figured that the only way to clean my conscience was to come forward and, and tell people about what I did and fuck the consequences. I started getting threat messages from veterans, uh, super patriotic veterans, um, calling me a traitor. Um, about three years ago, there was a group of veterans from a blog called This Ain't Hell, and uh, one of them threatened to find me and gut me like a fish and drag me through the street and make an example of me in front of the world. So, um, and he's from my hometown, so I decided to go back. Um, my When I uh, did the Bundestag in October, my mother was approached by the uh, Office of Special Investigations of the U.S. Air Force and told that she was on the ISIS kill list, and if I didn't stop speaking, then she would be hurt. Uh, so, the situation back home is kind of murky. <laughs> uh, um, as far as my attitude to the U.S., like, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't love my country. Like, I don't, like, the, the comparisons to World War II have been made. And we, we're not making them to say this is exactly like it, but it's being made to say if it's not already there, are we willing to stand by and let it get to that point? And so I'm standing in front of you, sitting technically, but I'm in front of you guys today and every time that I do this because I want my country to be better. I want us to learn from history. Like, I love my country. I don't want us to to go the way of, of, of another fallen empire. Uh, that was the wrong choice of words, but like, yeah, like maybe, maybe the empire needs to be shrunk down a little bit, but what needs to happen is my country needs to be held accountable before things do get out of hand, and I want my country to be held accountable. Hell, I'm standing in front of you guys because I'm holding myself accountable for my own actions. This is my penance for my mistakes. And so, if I can sit here and admit my mistakes and my faults, I want to set an example for my country to do that same thing, but I also want my allies and my friends to hold us accountable for that. Like, we can do better. Isn't that like some sort of political mumbo-jumbo? We, yes, we can. But like, the idea is, is that we are so interconnected right now, we, we, when a drone strike or, or something bad happens in the world, we know about it instantaneously. And the, the, the big fault of it is, is that, yeah, we know about it instantaneously and then it goes away instantaneously. But we should care enough about ourselves to not repeat history and to be involved with people that are being harmed all over the world and to not send our children to kill and die for causes that we're not even sure that we support. And so we need to do better. Like, we, we can't just, we can't make a political statement or a lawful statement. We just need to simply just do better. We have no excuse for this anymore. We have no excuse for our ignorance and our stupidity. If we have excuse me, the sum of all human knowledge at the tips of our fucking fingertips, we have no excuse. We have no excuse anymore.